Tuesdays on point. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Happy Tuesday. <laughs> We're going to wait just a few minutes. Allow some of you to join us. What do I have to do to get a like some Valley Vet paraphernalia? Hmm. Um, ask Lori. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I was just admiring your sweatshirt yes. and shirt and thinking I should probably get some of that. Or yeah. a hat for the bad hair days, which are often. <laughs> We've got some stuff. Yeah. They should they should get you some. Just send yeah. you some. Yeah. Great. So I was thinking Tony prep for these for Tony and I probably looks very different <laughs> <laughs> as far as the amount of time and effort. <laughs> you know, it's got very short hair and yep. uh, that doesn't take very long to uh, right on. Yeah. Not quite fair. <laughs> Not fair at all. Yeah. The hat might help level that up a little. <laughs> Mm -hmm. KJ is with us and Donald. Texas and Wyoming so far. Nice. I hear it is a scorcher in Texas. Well, anywhere down south, right? Oh. It's pretty awful right now. Where are they having flooding? Somewhere's having flooding. Oh. Is that Donald is actually oh, Karen hi, today. Karen. Hi, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Not Donald. <laughs> Virginia. Ohio. Yes, Texas is hot. Mm -hmm. Louisiana. D. Washington. Cool, Washington. Sharon from Virginia. Good group. Yeah. Yeah. At all corners of the country covered, pretty much. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, Karen likes our jokes. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Somebody, we somebody likes them. <laughs> we we knew thing. somebody would. <laughs> all right, I'll keep looking them up. <laughs> you mean you don't come up with those on your own? <laughs> uh, those are all on our own. We we think about them. Just all the time. Yeah. Okay. We don't take them off laugh, laughy, happy wrappers. <laughs> I don't get help from my nine year old. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. We have a good group. So we're going to go ahead and get started, guys. We have um, Dr. Lacey with us, and she is going to talk about biosecurity and the best practice for horses and livestock. Be sure if you have any questions for her, get those in the comments and she will get those answered for you. So with that, Dr. Lacey, we're gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks guys. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, I do feel like this is a really timely topic that we're covering because so many county fairs, rodeos, horse shows, all those things are happening right now. Uh, and so I think it, it's a really good refresher um, just on the little things that you can do uh, that will hopefully make a big impact on keeping your livestock healthy and for you to be able to go out there and travel and uh, have a good time and, and be successful without worrying about bringing anything home back to your, your breeding stock or um, your flock or your herd. So, um, so yeah, that's basically what we're going to cover today. I know it's not the most exciting topic, biosecurity, but I feel like it's really important um, when you think about the big picture all the things that we do to help our livestock or horses perform at their highest level, um, you know, all of that could unfortunately be undone if you're not careful and vigilant about the disease control on and off your place. So just hopefully today we're going to give you some, some tips on things you can do prior to going uh, to these events, things that are important to remember while you're there. And then of course, in my opinion, maybe the most important aspect, the things you do with those animals when they come back to your place and your equipment. Um, so we'll kind of get into that. That's the gist of where we're headed today on the topic of biosecurity. And like they said, if you have any questions um, as we're going along, feel free to interject those and we'll, we'll try to either answer them in the moment we're on that topic or at the end for sure. So, so um, don't hesitate to, to get with us on the questions. So biosecurity, you know, why should it be a priority? Um, basically, because 
It really is the development and the implementation of management practices that are going to reduce or prevent disease um, transmission from entering your herd or your flock. And so not only do you need to put a little bit of thought into implementing a plan and making sure you know who's in charge of, of which tasks are associated with that, um, but also you know that you actually institute that plan. So you need to think about it beforehand and do some research or think about where you're going or the things that they might be susceptible to do as well as when you come home that you're set up for success so that you can minimize the transmission of any contagious diseases to your other livestock and horses as well. So, so that's kind of what biosecurity is. It's really just putting some thought into the practices, the management practices um, that you can do to help limit the transmission of disease and decrease the risk that you're gonna have sick animals following the, the travel that they, they incur. So, you know, why is it important I think it's pretty obvious if you care a lot about your animals um, or if they are even a source of income for you, you know, if, if rodeos are your livelihood or help, you know, uh, complement your income and you want to keep those animals healthy so you can keep going to those events um, or you can make that sale um, to the those uh, folks when you're going out um, to a show to market your livestock. You know, these are all important avenues. Um, for generating revenue. And so we don't want the animal's health uh, to impact your ability to, of course, have success, whether that's just from a personal pride perspective or also you know, monetarily, we want to limit the losses of animals, the sickness and costs involved with treatment, um, as well as just overall financial loss too. So just things to think about, about why is biosecurity really important, even though it's not that fun to think about, um, why it's crucial, I think. So uh, as far as the first thing, you know, talking about prevention, I think good animal husbandry is really just an extension of biosecurity. So it's not like you have to have some elaborate seven step plan in place. It's really just kind of focusing in on the details and making sure you are really in tune with your livestock. So just knowing what normal is for your livestock and spending a little time, you know, observing them at home will help you recognize when things are wrong or when they are unhealthy. Um, because, you know, you want to be able to intervene in the disease process early on. So when they're first showing clinical signs, like maybe their appetite is off just a little bit, or maybe their stool is just a little bit off and not normal consistency. Those are the little things that can help you assess the animal and go, do I need to institute a treatment? Do I need to have a veterinarian come look at the animal um, before I decide to take them out um, on the road and expose other animals to something they may be currently fighting off? Um, because it is a two-way street biosecurity, right? So I think we all think of it from our own perspective, selfish perspective, where we're like, I don't want my animals to be come home with something. You know, I don't want just like when your kids go to daycare, you're like, I don't want my kids to bring home sickness or them to get sick. But just as importantly is to clean the things that you have at home and make sure you're doing everything from a vaccine standpoint and whatnot so that when you take your animals out there, if they're carriers of something, they're not exposing anyone else to it either. So thinking of it from, from both ways and just kind of having a mutual respect for other exhibitors, I think it is really important as well when you're, when you're analyzing your animal at home and going, you know, I'm supposed to leave tomorrow morning, but she went off feed tonight, or she's coughing a little bit today, you know, trying to make a wise decision on whether or not you should take that animal to that next event, you know, maybe having the vet out, assessing them, giving them a better evaluation might help you to decide that, you know what, that she can't write that health certificate for that animal. And it's just not worth the risk, even if it's just a mild clinical sign, it's not worth the risk to expose other people or make your animals mild version of sickness much worse if they're exposed to stress once they're out on the road. So, um, so prevention, I think paying close attention to your own animals, knowing what's normal for them, you know, knowing what their normal respiratory rate is, for instance, like at rest, do they just naturally, because it's a hot sheep, and it has extra wool, do they breathe 60 times a minute, you know, versus normally when they're at rest, they, you know, maybe something else, uh, you know, a cow, for instance, maybe 30, 30 breaths per minute is more normal. So that way you can tell if they're getting the early signs of respiratory disease, those kind of things, just by knowing how they normally act, what they normally look like, what their normal behavior is. So 
anyways, just that one is kind of a common sense thing, but I do think that if you put in the time to really be in tune with your animals, it helps you to know whether or not they're developing a disease process and determining if they should go out on the road at all to begin with when we're talking about prevention. Now, other prevention things, um, I think, I guess a, a big one in my mind is, um, you know, having a solid vaccine program in place and making sure that you give those uh, vaccines in a timely manner so that they can do the protective work they need to do um, before they're exposed to those pathogens out on the road. So for instance, you know, an immune system of an animal, they're responding to a vaccination, but it takes time because the vaccine, you'd give the injection and it's not like instantly they're protected for that disease, right? We need our own uh, immune cells, our dendritic cells, they go into action once that you've had given that vaccine and then they take it back to the basically kind of like the immune center and start manufacturing antibodies. So think of your immune system, you know, as a production line of sorts. So they need time to respond to that vaccine, make those antibodies and then have enough of those antibodies to be protective. So be sure that you're giving um, like your, let's say your pre-breeding vaccines on your heifers need to be given well in advance of when they travel so that they're protected against abortion agents that could cause them to lose their, their calf or their foal. Um, so you don't want to give it just the week before you go out on the road. You want to give it at least a month, I would say, in advance um, so that their immune system has had time to make those antibodies so that they can respond to the disease and hopefully not even get sick. Um, so that's something to think about. You'll want to work with your veterinarian to know, you know, what diseases do you need to be concerned about for your species, your geography, um, the places that you're you're planning to go. And so they can help you formulate a good plan of these are the pathogens you really need to be concerned about. These are ones that you're at a lower risk for and maybe we could leave out because the immune system can't respond to everything at once. Um, so that's another thing to consider. I think as we're trying to, to protect our livestock, if we get overboard and give them too many antigens at once, then they don't create a great response to any of them. So maybe staggering how you approach that um, and your veterinarian can, can help you with that and just making sure it's given in a timely manner. Um, the other thing um, when it comes to the, the cattle side of things, um, kind of a newer technology uh, and philosophy that's starting to, to be utilized more in helping cattle boost their immunity close to a stressful event, like going to a show or being being trucked somewhere, would be to use an intranasal vaccine. And so, you know, typically we're giving injections of vaccinations, but the intranasal form of some of these cattle vaccines can actually boost their immune system locally within the nasal cavity and the upper airway. And so the timeline for that to hopefully get the most benefit from doing something like that would be to give an intranasal vaccine about six to 14 days before you're gonna be um, taking them out on the road or exposing them to those pathogens. Um, and then just keep in mind that that upper respiratory local immunity, the mucosal immunity we call it, that creates the, the IgA response only lasts for about 28 days. So you might even need to booster them again if your show season is many months long. So that's just one little thing that there, there's not a ton of research out there yet to say exactly how beneficial it is. But I have heard, you know, anecdotally that giving an intranasal vaccine prior to those stressors can really boost their immunity and it increases interferon, which is a protein that kind of helps them overall fight off disease. So, so that's something to consider. Um, and then the other thing when you're thinking about prevention, um, I guess if, if we talk about just a couple, I don't want to get really deep into every single disease process that your that your livestock could encounter because we'd be here a really long time and not everybody would care about everybody's species, right? Um, and so I thought I might hit the high notes on a couple of the more hot topic circulating diseases that are very contagious um, that you should be aware of and maybe some clinical signs associated with those so that you can be aware of those and have those top of mind as you're before you're heading out on the road um, and make sure that your vaccine protocols hopefully have pathogens, have those antigens covered. Um, so for, for cattle, for instance, some of the viral diseases that I guess I'm pretty concerned about when people are heading out on the road, um, some of the top ones would be um, IBR, which is a herpes virus, so infectious bovine rhinotracheitis um, used to be called red nose because sometimes their mucosa and their nose would get really red with it. Um, it can cause respiratory disease. It can cause 
um, definitely some fertility issues. And I guess that's with the breeding stock that heads out on the road. That's one of the things I'm, I'm concerned about as a veterinarian is the protection of your herd when they come come back. That individual animal, obviously, they're one of your prized possessions if you're taking them out on the road. Um, but you also want to protect the ones that when you get home. The, so you don't want them to cause an abortion storm, for instance, in your cows. Uh, BVD or bovine viral diarrhea is another important one to have in your program. And the other thing about that is if you're taking a bred heifer out um, and she's going to be exposed to potentially other animals who could be carriers of BVD, there is a, a window within their gestation where if they are exposed to that particular disease during that about 50 day period, um, then they can, that fetus that they're carrying can actually turn into what we call a persistently infected animal for BVD. And those can be catastrophic to a herd health program. Um, as far as they don't, the calf, because they're exposed when that cow is in gestation, um, they view that PVD virus as self and they don't fight it off. They don't recognize it as something they need to ward off. So when they're born, they actually just turn into a machine for making bovine viral diarrhea virus. So they are shedding it in their manure, in their nasal secretions. And unfortunately, the thing about BVD is it immune compromises everybody it comes in contact with. So even if they don't die from it, you know, they, their growth may be stunted or you may see the rates of your respiratory disease within your herd skyrocket and you, and you can't figure out why, you know, what you haven't changed anything management wise. Um, it could be because you have a persistently infected BVD carrier that hit the ground at your house that was born there, but they were exposed elsewhere. So you brought it home because she was exposed while she was carrying that calf. So that's just one example of why I think it's so important to make sure you have a solid vaccine program in place and that the animal is as protected as it can be um, before it comes back home and could expose your other cattle to um, cause a lot of issues within the herd. Uh, other things to, to worry about on the cattle side, um, you know, bovine leukosis virus, that's actually more of a bloodborne um, issue in cattle. Uh, but that and anaplasmosis and uh, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, all of those, you know, there are, there are instances where insect vectors and other ways that there could be bodily fluid transmission or blood transmission all contribute to those being transmitted amongst those animals. And so having a good fly control program, um, trying to keep insect uh, burden down on those animals while you're on the road and at home as well, so they don't become carriers. And I know there's a lot of ticks in certain regions of the country. And so decreasing your risk for that is difficult. But if you can put fly tags in, if you can you know, spray premises um, and remove manure piles, those kind of things, um, to try to decrease the amount of insect vectors in your area that will help that decrease the transmission risk. So just little things you can do um, back at your place. The other thing um, for cattle that's a big one is pneumonia. So bovine respiratory disease is always one of the biggest health concerns we have with cattle. And if you can have a pasteurella vaccine on board well in advance of traveling, that's a good idea. Because at a cattle show, which we're going to talk more about at the event, you know, things you can do or try to avoid. It's sometimes it's almost impossible to keep them completely isolated from the, the other people's cattle. Like whether someone at tie outs across from you, maybe their heifer has a really nasty nasal discharge. Maybe she's coughing and she it didn't develop till she was on the road, but you know, their fence line to fence line across there from each other at tie outs or in the stall area. And sometimes there's not a lot of separation and there's just not, much you can do to control that some at some of these shows so you want to make sure your animal is as protected as possible by having those vaccines on board and hopefully keeping their immune system functioning at a high level and you know having a solid nutrition program in place all those things help um, so when it comes to cattle those are some of my top concerns as far as diseases you want to make sure you're covered for um, and then the other thing on horses to consider i feel like this one is is a really big one because there's been some outbreaks of vesicular stomatitis lately, which is a viral disease in horses. It can affect donkeys, cattle, swine, uh, even camelids like alpacas and llamas can get it as well. Um, so that one's hot in the news because there are currently some outbreaks of vesicular stomatitis going on in Texas and in California. And as veterinarians, we we are actually having to you know change some of the ways that we do our health certificates because of those recent outbreaks. So some of those events, which if you're an equine exhibitor, um, rodeo participant, 
you might want to look at that specific event or that state's requirements because um, we're having to write our health papers even closer up to the event. So maybe it's required that that health paper be written five days prior to the event. So you have to make sure you're scheduling that appropriately with your veterinarian, whereas typically your health certificate would be good for like 30 days. But with some of these outbreaks uh, of these really contagious diseases, that might be changing for some of those events or some states. So be aware of that. Um, the other viral that, um, issue in horses that is really a top concern is the is the herpes virus. So um, the other thing, like the way it's referred to as far as inclusion in your combination vaccines, you may have seen it called rhino. So rhino is herpes, same thing. Um, and then EHV is, is the acronym for it. So equine herpes virus, and typically the ones we're the most concerned about are type one and type four. And the reason for that is type one has been associated with some neurological uh, effects. And that one, a uh, few years back, uh, there was a really high caliber uh, equine event in Utah, and there was a, a lot of spread of the EHV1 type, and it caused a lot of havoc for people as far as quarantining large numbers uh, of horses at different locations and really limiting their ability to travel. So that's the other reason having your animals up to date, current on their vaccines is so important. If you wanna be able to go to these events and keep them functioning, you know, we all have to do our part at home to make sure that we're covered and that hopefully these diseases are minimized uh, for sure. But EHV one and four can cause severe uh, pneumonia. Uh, they can cause abortions. So that's why it's really important in your pregnant mares, if they're traveling at all, that they are given and in a very timely manner, uh, the vaccines to cover them for pathogens like rhino um, to prevent abortion and then the neurologic effects, which honestly, it, you know, there's not a vaccine that specifically says they're protective for, against the neurologic issues, but we're hoping we get some cross coverage from the EHV1 and 4 that cause respiratory disease. Um, and there's really no cure. Once they're showing neurologic signs for herpes virus, it's, it's pretty deadly. So that one is really serious. Um, you know, it can be transmitted through uh, air particles. So you want to limit nose to nose contact um, with horses as much as possible um, and, and know that, you know, they don't have to necessarily be in direct contact. Those particles can float through the air. So um, that's that's one that's highly contagious, a big concern you want to keep your eye out for. Vesicular stomatitis, going back to that one that affects primarily horses is are the ones that have the most symptoms. Um, that causes blister-like uh, little lesions on their, typically around their mouth, but it can be on their tongue. Um, they can't even get them in their ears and it can be visible on their muzzle as well. And that one is even a bigger concern for livestock as well, because it can mimic some of the same signs that we see with foot and mouth disease, which would be devastating for our trade of livestock um, and livestock products internationally. So it's important that if you do see some of these signs, you don't ignore them. And even if you think you might be overreacting, have a veterinarian look at it. Regulatory vets might even need to take a look um, just to be sure we're safeguarding our food supply and other equine participants um, because you don't want any of this to get out of hand. Um, that one, the vesicular stomatitis, is transmissible by insects. So black sand, black and sand flies, as well as the biting midges are some of the ones that are responsible uh, for transmitting that. That's why it's important to get your, you know, really protect them against flies, do everything you can, whether that's a fly sheet, sprays, getting it inside the ears, because that's where the black flies like to bite, um, is important to try to decrease the chance that they'll get vesicular stomatitis. So it's insect born, but then it's transmissible through direct contact as well. So if you have a horse that has some of those lesions on their lips, and they come in contact with another horse or their saliva gets in water um, that is shared amongst other horses, that saliva can, it's contagious. And so then the next horse can get it and develop those same lesions. And it's while they have the lesions um, and that that exudate that comes from those lesions are what makes them so contagious. So um, just be aware, typically it's not fatal. Um, they usually recover quite well with just some supportive care. They may go off food and water a little bit if they're super painful and have those lesions in their mouth, but usually within 14 days they recover. So just know that, um, cause I feel like sometimes people might be apprehensive about getting help when they see lesions like this, because they don't want to face a quarantine um, that would be enforced or something of that nature. But a lot of these diseases, they really 
as long as you can quarantine them and keep them home, they're not, they can actually not be that big a deal as far as impacting you and your operation long term. It's just a matter of being responsible at the time that you notice those things to minimize the effect for everybody, you know, and so I think that's really important as well. Other horse uh, diseases that you want to, you know, that we're all should be aware of and be pretty cognizant of. Um, equine influenza is another one that is highly contagious. Um, those horses typically have a really elevated body temperature. So it tempts as high as like 105. Um, and, and of course they have some issues respiratory wise, they're coughing, they have nasal discharge, um, but you can vaccinate for influenza as well. So I'd highly recommend that if they're gonna be exposed to a lot of other horses. And then of course the dreaded strangles, um, you know, that's that bacteria strep equi that is just super contagious um, to horses. And, you know, in sale barns or facilities where there's a lot of equine um, activity and therefore a lot of pathogens just tend to build up on the, in those facilities because they're used so frequently, this is one of those diseases that people should be most aware of and, and vigilant about. Um, typically they recover and some people just view it as a rite of passage, but it can be deadly um, in certain instances. And so you want to make sure you're doing everything on your end to um, try to minimize the, the chances they're going to get a strangles infection or that you're going to bring that back to your barn or your home. You know, those, some of the clinical signs of strangles would be nasal discharge, you know, just lethargy. And then of course that trademark just enlarged lymph nodes, especially underneath their chin. Um, seeing those. So highly contagious because it either directly they can be contagious to other animals or also on the surface of um, especially wood, which I know is hard to disinfect. If some of the pus uh, from those enlarged lymph nodes, when they do tend to bust open, if that gets on some of the areas within the stall, within the watering area, um, you know, that can be contagious for weeks. It's a, it's a hard bug to kill. And so um, just want to be aware of that and really disinfect things or minimize the chance that your animal is going to be using a water bucket that an animal who was at that sale barn last week had strangles and was exposed to. So having your own equipment and keeping it really clean and sanitized, hugely important to minimize the, the spread of strangles. And of course, your quarantine time when you get home, I can't emphasize that enough, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But with strangles, I feel like it's ultra important um, to minimize the chance that you're going to bring strangles back to your young horses, to other horses on your farm, um, or have, a, you know, if you have a carrier develop, that can, can be really hard to, to get it off of your place once it's there. So prevention is the key for sure. Um, so those are some of the things heading out beforehand that I think you can do to decrease your risk. That's the prevention you know, one ounce of prevention is worth, you know, a pound of treatment. Like we as veterinarians, especially preventative medicine, something really, really passionate about because, you know, if it's the, your best option to try to decrease disease. The one thing I was going to mention a resource that equine uh, participants and exhibitors might want to utilize that could help them decide, you know, maybe I don't want to go to that show in Texas because it's just too high risk, you know, um, or wherever there's been a recent outbreak. Um, there's a resource online that can help keep you abreast to um, where diseases have been reported recently and how many animals and if they're currently under quarantine and all of that. Um, and so it's the website, if you want to write this down, is called equinediseasecc.org. And that's put on by the Equine Disease Communication Center. Um, great resource. They keep it very up to date and with alerts even. I think you can even sign up for alerts so that you're aware constantly if there's an outbreak in your region of any certain disease. Um, so I, I can't emphasize enough that that might be helpful before you head out on the road to know where some disease outbreaks are happening. So as far as at the show, um, you know, once you've arrived, you've done everything on your end that you can to prevent disease, um, and make sure your animals are as healthy as possible heading out on the road. But once you get there, here's some things that you can remember that might be helpful to try to decrease the chance your animal will get exposed or get sick while they're at that event. Um, one thing, like it, sometimes it sounds like a great idea to carpool with folks, right? So you're like, oh, well, you're going to junior nationals too, and we live two miles apart. Um, you know, we should just ride together and put our livestock in the same trailer. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are times that if you think they have a solid health program at home and, you're, and you know that, that you could do that and probably be fine. But you really want to try to minimize the, the chance of those combined shipments 
or co-mingled shipments, we call it, because the trailer air, depending on the type of trailer it is, you know, they really get the circulation of those pathogens when those trailers are still, um, they really would get exposed to a higher dose. If somebody's shedding a viral aerosolized uh, pathogen in those trailers, whether if they're closed up a little bit more, depending on the time of year, you know, they can really send a high dose down the just down the trailer to your animal. So if you can avoid shipments together, I think that's wise. Um, of course, once you get to an event, don't share any equipment, especially feed and water uh, related equipment, right? Um, sometimes at certain shows, they'll have like a, a tub or water tank that is just filled up all the time so that it's easier for people to just go over and use that. And I would just really discourage you from using those communal type water situations and just bring your own buckets. Um, make sure that nobody else is using your buckets either. Um, and that will help hopefully cut down on their exposure level. Um, another thing, if there's a hose that's being used communally attached to a hydrant, um, don't let your animal drink out of that hose directly. Um, and also don't submerge that end of that hose into your water bucket. Because if, if somebody else just did the same thing, you're just gonna transfer some of those pathogens potentially from one water bucket to the next. Um, so just little things that can help minimize their exposure. Um, basically um, try to eliminate, you, I know it's hard to do at times because maybe you're you know all going to go check in your livestock together. And so you're like, yeah, I can lend a hand. I'll lead your heifer to tie outs tonight, or I'll, I'll help you do this or that. Um, but when you expose yourself to other animals at that event, and if you even just your clothes, like maybe you washed your hands before you went back to your own cattle, but if your clothes are carrying some of their, their saliva or their mucus from their nasal passages, um, it could be contagious to your own stock when you go back to work with yours. So if you and your team, so that means mom, dad, friends, whoever's in your crew, you know, everybody needs to try to be cognizant of limiting your exposure to other animals that are there and just trying to only touch and mess with your own livestock is what I would suggest. Um, when we were, we were talking earlier a little bit about the importance of, of insect vector control. So that's especially important, I feel like, once you're at the event. So fly spray, protective coverings, um, you know, the horse thing, as far as daylight and dusk, that's when those culicoides midges are out more frequently. So I'm trying to keep them indoors or especially keep that fly sheet on during daylight and dusk hours when those vectors are most active can be pretty helpful as well to limiting the, the spread of disease. And then uh, premises too, you might could spray fly um, control around the premises of your stall or on your trailer, things like that. Um, your maybe even your tie out area to try to decrease the chance you're going to get. Um, one of the things I mostly worry about are what they call tamponids, which are like horse flies, because generally, aside from like vesicular stomatitis, um, generally it's the big horse flies um, that you're worried about having enough blood and enough pathogen level to transmit it from one animal to another. Flies, like horn flies, live on one animal and just kind of stay there. But those horse flies can, they definitely can transmit disease. So keeping um, some sort of a fly controller spray on that will limit the amount of um, those insects, particularly on your animals, can be really helpful. The other thing while you're at the show, um, so we, we call those fomites. So when we talk about the water buckets, we talk about feed pans, but even your brushes um, and and your clippers and things like that, that you don't, you wouldn't think like your clippers are, are going to be. Oops. Bruce up a little here. Yeah. Hmm. It's really froze up. Yeah. I think we're still good. Mm -hmm. We're going to hold on just a little yeah. bit. We'll wait here. She'll hop back on. Mm -hmm. 
Where's the jokes now? <laughs> I'm not prepared. <laughs> question from Kathleen there too. I see. Mosquito control. Let's see if she hops back on here. Um, I will pin that site she was talking about as well when we are done here. Hold tight just a second. We're going to see if we can get Dr. Lacey back on here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, put those in the comments. We will get to those one way or another. Sorry about that. You're all right. No problem. Okay. I I'd like to say that about. I kept them busy and entertained while you were gone, but not really. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's okay. I don't know why my internet disconnected, but um, it did. So it I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully now we'll be good. I'm running off of the hotspot on my cell phone, but we'll okay. go with that. So, <laughs> but basically where we were at before, um, when we were talking about at the show, things that you can do to try to minimize disease and transmission. Um, I think we pretty much covered that as far as, as we can do. Big thing is um, there are isolation areas at shows nowadays, especially like AQH events. Um, AQHA events. Uh, so if you're monitoring your animal closely, so that means taking temperatures every day, maybe even to try to catch early the signs of a disease outbreak. Um, if you notice an ele a big elevation in temperature swing or even a mild one, and you think, you know what, maybe out of precaution, I should take my horse over to the the um, isolation area and just kind of have them monitored over there and an area where they're not nose to nose contact with as many of the other horses. So you still may be able to exhibit, but it's just an area where you're going to pay a little closer attention to them. So while you're at the show, making sure you're monitoring them, um, if they seem off, maybe taking their temperature and letting that guide you as to whether you need to pull them from that event or maybe try to isolate them before they try to spread anything else um, to other people's animals. So just another thing while you're at the show, being vigilant of your own animals, I think, and then respecting everyone else by pulling them out of that area if you think they're becoming contagious or showing signs of illness is a, a responsible thing to do. And then of course, while you're at the event, wash your hands really frequently. I mean, that goes without saying, but um, you know, we all get busy at those events, they're hectic, and but that's the best way for you to hopefully not contaminate between animals if you are helping with other people's livestock uh, as well. So those were the kind of the things to do while you're, we've talked about prevention, we've talked about what to do and not to do while you're at the show. 
Now on to kind of the, the part that I think is maybe most important, which is what to do once you get done with that event and you're headed home. So as far as after the, uh, the show, you know, the biosecurity, it doesn't end by being at the show. It, it's really important to have some things in place at home to decrease the chance that the rest of your livestock are going to get sick. Um, and so the equipment and the trailer itself should be clean cleaned and disinfected. And when we talk about cleaning your equipment, so that's getting, just using a detergent, like a soap to get off a lot of the debris or the manure. So doing that first, so that then a disinfectant can do its job and actually kill the pathogens. So the first off, just cleaning your trailer, getting out all the dirty bedding, um, and then applying a disinfectant after you've cleaned it well and letting that disinfectant sit on long enough to kill those pathogens. Um, and then making sure it's fully dry before you use it again for the next event. But so it would almost have like a dirty unloading area that, you know, when you go home, this is the area we're going to put the things that we haven't had time to clean yet. And then not take it back into like the general area that you have maybe livestock that didn't go to that event or other horses in your barn at. And then of course, um, your own shoes and your show box and, you know, all of those things, which I think growing up, you know, we probably should have been more vigilant, especially about the shoe part, um, because the manure that you could have tracked in, you know, from someone else's animal could be carrying contagious particles. And so you just want to make sure you're doing everything you can once you get home to minimize uh, the chance that the other animals are going to contract disease. Um, so really cleaning all the equipment as well as your shoes, as well as any tack you used and the trailer before you use it the next time. Um, as far as the quarantine, I think that's the really critical part, right? If you're, whether you're buying an animal while you're at that event and you bring home a new um, addition to the herd or a new horse, you really want to keep them separate and isolated from the rest of your stock for, for 30 days, ideally. So I know that's not feasible for everyone, um, but if at all possible in an area where there is no nose to nose contact for sure, and even even far enough where aerosolized particles hopefully won't be able to reach the stock that didn't go on that trip um, or your current herd would be ideal. Um, and even if, if two weeks is all you can manage before you, you know, can't keep feeding them in, in multiple locations or, um, you know, having enough water and shelter in multiple locations, at, at least two weeks, maybe 30 would be great. And so, um, you know, just keeping that in mind and doing everything possible because that what that time period allows you to do is to monitor the thing you brought home or the new addition and watch them for signs of disease. And also, hopefully, hopefully they don't get sick at all, right? And so you're watching them vigilantly and making sure they have a good appetite and making sure they don't cough or look, look like they're off. But also, um, if, they, if they don't get sick or if they're a carrier that is asymptomatic, it really allows that incubation time period to go by so that they're clear of it by the time that 30 day quarantine is up, then you can put them with your other livestock and be pretty confident that they're not shedding it any longer because the incubation period where that disease was circulating in their system has passed. And so they should be, um, you know, good to go as far as not being a high shedder when you put them in with your other livestock. So um, big, that's probably one of the biggest take homes. You really want to make sure that when you bring them home, you don't just throw them back out with the other cattle that didn't go or horses. And if you have a new addition, in addition to quarantining, the other thing that I guess, you know, me personally that I recommend for the folks I consult with is doing some surveillance testing for some of those diseases that you don't want in your flock or in your herd. Um, and so when they're in, while they're in quarantine, you know, have your vet come out at the early part of the quarantine, pull the blood or do the nasal swabs, whatever you need to do. And that way you have plenty of time to get the results back on some of that testing to determine whether or not you can put them with the rest of your herd or maybe even send them back if, if there's a time period there when, with an animal you purchased and let's say they didn't do the testing that you were hoping they would so that you won't bring in a, anything that could cause a major herd health issue, you know, then maybe you've got time to send that back animal back to the place that you purchased it if they come up positive as a carrier for some of these diseases that we're really concerned about. Um, so those are important things to, to keep in mind. Um, and if you do see signs of illness in the animals you bring home, probably contacting your vet immediately and having them come out and assess them and then draw those, take those samples um, so you can figure out what's going on before it spreads uh, is really important. So 30 day quarantine, 
absolutely important. I know it doesn't always happen, um, but it really should if you want to minimize the effect on the rest of your herd. Um, so as far as, you know, those are kind of the, the main things I didn't go over. There are some small ruminant ish diseases that I think everyone should be most really aware of as well. Um, sore mouth or ORF is one of those. So if you see little lesions around their mouth, like we were talking about, they are kind of similar to what you see with vesicular stomatitis in horses. But when you see that in goats, you um, really want to isolate them. And fungus like ringworm, like we were talking about, those would be reasons that you can't take your animals to the show. If you see them exhibiting these signs, don't even try to go, right? Because you could get kicked out while you're trying to check them in. Like, just don't try to hide it. Just come, to, you know, accept the fact that it was bad timing and your animal has this issue. But because of the well being for everyone else, you know, be responsible and keep those animals at home because some of these are zoonotic, right? And so when we say zoonotic, we mean contagious to people. And so not only are you trying to keep the livestock healthy and our food supply safe, but you also don't want anyone's kid to end up with a fungal infection um, or if there's immune compromised people at that county fair um, and then they get exposed to some of these diseases, you know, can make them really sick. So um, just being responsible, keeping a close eye on your animals and being aware of those, I think are, are really important things to do. Um, Casey, when we were talking about strangles and horses, another disease that is similar in how it presents in goats um, is, that comes to mind for me is what we call CL for short, but it stands for caseous lymphadenitis. And so the uh, lymph nodes in goats, a lot of times right under their ear will get enlarged. And so if you see knots like that right under the ear of your goat, um, you know, it could be an abscess forming and it may be just an abscess lymph node for another reason, but I would take real precautions um, because caseous lymphadenitis also highly contagious when those lymph nodes abscess and burst, they, they spread that all around, contaminate the area, and it can be really pathogenic within a flock. And so those are another one to keep an eye out for um, because it contaminates the environment so badly. Um, and then Yoni's disease. So I guess another thing to be really aware of is that your younger animals are even more susceptible, right? Because they haven't been exposed to these pathogens a lot of times before, especially if you have a closed herd at home or if they just, they're young and maybe they didn't get enough colostrum. So their immune system could be weak. You want to make sure that if you're going to take, take like a cow calf pair, for instance, out on the road, that that calf has had as many vaccines as it should and what is appropriate, um, because they are, like I said, especially vulnerable to disease transmission. And so you want to really protect your young ones and your young horses as well. One thing on these goats and sheep, um, like Yoni's disease, um, which is a highly contagious disease uh, that is spread through the fecal oral route. So um, shedders they send out those particles in their manure and then it can be picked up um, by baby goats, by baby calves. Um, and so that's highly contagious and it's deadly and there's no treatment for Yoni's disease. They just wither away over time um, because they get diarrhea and they can't absorb any nutrients. So um, those are just some of the ones to be really cognizant of and that maybe if you are bringing in new additions to your herd that you might want to talk to your vet about developing a biosecurity testing plan that you just say any new addition I purchase, if it's a goat, I want it tested for CAE, which is a virus um, that is highly pathogenic and common in goats as well as caseous lymphadenitis and Yoni's disease. You know, those are just, just an example to throw out there, but some of those really contagious diseases that if you bring them into your flock, you know, you might think this looks like the best buck I've ever seen. You know, he's gonna be a game changer in my operation for breeding purposes. But if you don't do the proper testing and make sure that he's clean before he enters your, your flock, then, I mean, he, you could be undoing years of your vigilance to make sure you've taken good care of your livestock um, and so just one addition or thinking that it wasn't worth the time or the money to do that biosecurity testing um, could cost you so much in the long run. And it's, you know, some of these diseases, because they stay in the environment for so long, are really hard to. Oh, shoot. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh Technical difficulties yes. today. Darn it. She will be back on here. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
Uh, yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> there you are. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it just kicked me. I could hear you guys. But, you know. So, anyways, on the goat, it's a small ruminant side. Very important um, with those species as well to be vigilant. So, all the way across the board, a lot of the principles we discussed, I think, apply to really any species. And so, if you'll try to institute some of those things, um, you know, I think in the long run, it keeps our food supply safe and it protects your investments, you know, and keeps those animals healthy. And from their standpoint, I really think it's the responsible thing to do, to do everything in our power to try to minimize the chance that there's going to be transmissible diseases. You know, we're bringing in animals from all across the country, different places. You know, inevitably, some disease transmission is going to occur. But if we can do everything we can to minimize that risk, um, then we can sleep better at night knowing we, we did the best we could to try to keep our livestock healthy. So any questions? Yeah, we had um, a couple questions about best mosquito control and fly control. Okay. Um, well, I mean, as far as horses go, I feel like the the sh fly sheets at dawn and dusk are really important. I think they work pretty well, but I'd also want to use spray on the areas that weren't covered as well. So their distal limbs and on their faces, of course, um, and bellies uh, really want to hit those well. Uh, there's just a lot of great options in terms of um, products that I think are efficacious that work. Um, I wish they worked longer, right? Because that that's the part that can be frustrating is you just don't get the duration of coverage out of some of those products that you'd like, or if they're sweating a lot, or if they get rained on, you know, it just doesn't last as long. So just be aware. And like, if you're going back country camping, or you're going to a show, apply that stuff frequently. So I would say, you know, just doing it both morning and night, or if they've sweat a lot during the day, reapplying often um, is, is what you're going to have to do. But I know flies, the, all the moisture we've had up here, I'm in Montana. And so it's been unseasonably wet here. I know other parts of the country are, you know, have experienced drought, but we have a worse fly product or a worse, a worse fly burden than we've had in a long time. And so some of those products are really being put to the test, right? But I think using a multimodal approach where you have fly tags and maybe you spray them at some point in the season, or you have um, do a fly, a pour on when you precondition your calves to try to decrease the, the weight loss and performance that can be associated with them fighting off all those flies. Uh, is important or having some of those back rubbers out. Um, so doing kind of hitting them from multiple different directions, I think does decrease the burden and maybe even instituting having some IGR control uh, within like your mineral can help decrease the, you know, the life cycle, uh, the production of some of those um, fly vectors. But yeah, I wish I had a silver bullet, but I do think the other thing with horses that I've found that I tend to like is the wipes. I think sometimes um, like the fly swat, some of those products um, maybe stay on a little bit longer and deter more flies around their ears and faces than, than a spray alone. So that might be something to consider. We didn't have any other questions besides that. All right. If you do have questions, go ahead and put those in the comments um, and we can get with Dr. Lacey. Mm -hmm. Get those answered yeah everybody's complaining about flies that's that's universal <laughs> yes. it's just a bad bad year <laughs> yeah and rotating of course like what products you use um in case you think there's some resistance developing to some of those those products um because just like in the even in the small animal world like there are certain products that fleas in certain part of the countries just it doesn't work on them anymore. And uh, it's a it's a sad reality, but sometimes you have to consider rotating those products to find the one that really works um, best with where you're located. And working with your local vet can help you determine, you know, what's being what's really working well as far as fly control goes. All right. Yeah. Well, sorry about freezing up on you guys. <laughs> you're fine. I, I have no idea what's happened uh, with my home internet, but uh, thanks for those of you who stuck with us through that technical difficulty. I appreciate it. Um, Technology and, can be fun and challenging. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. All right, thanks, All right. Guys. thank you, Dr. Thank Lacey. You. Take care.
All right. Uh, join us next Wednesday. We'll be live again with Dr. Wayne Ayers from Alenco, and he's going to be talking about the most important reasons for fly control in your herd. And that's all we have for you today. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you, guys. Bye.